call the meeting of the Davis County Board of Commissioners Tuesday, April the 28th, 2020. Call the meeting to order. And I'm going to start, first of all, by just making a comment. I just got a message from um, Commissioner Elliott that the vice principal of Lexington High School has been killed in an accident. So, uh, Fred, if you heard that, maybe you could do something during the prayer today. Um, I'd like to ask Debbie to do a roll call for the meeting tonight, first of all. And that way we will make it official. Commissioner Crotts, would you please answer by here? Yeah, here. I was trying to hit the mute button. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Elliott? Here. Commissioner McClure? Yeah. Commissioner Shell? Here. Vice Chair Trull? I'm here. Commissioner Yates? Here. Chair Here. Thank you. It's Commissioner McClure's turn to do the invocation and the pledge. I'll call on you. All right. I appreciate that. Do you know what the uh, principal, assistant principal's name was out there at Lexington? Mr. It's Elliott. Holly Henson. Holly Henson. Henson. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you for the blessings that we have. We know we don't have anything except it comes from you. Lord, we thank you for Davidson County. We thank you for the folks that are commissioners and other leaders um, that are willing to put forth their effort and their time um, and their decision-making and, and to be able to make good decisions for our county. But we ask that you, especially that you'd be with this assistant uh, principal, Mr. Henson, and uh, be with his family as this, his uh, death is going to be real hard for them. It's something hard for them to go through, but you can provide the comfort and the peace, and we just ask you to do that. Now, as we look to our meeting today, we ask, Lord, for your wisdom uh, in what we do and what we say. We would ask that we will be able to use your discernment on the issues that come before us, and we would ask that uh, all of us, everyone here, everyone there, would be, whatever we say, would bring honor and glory to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Ready, friend? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One, One nation, nation, under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, we had planned to recognize Representative Jarvis and Representative Potts tonight to give us a legislative update, but they had several meetings, um, and they are in Raleigh, so I'm sure we'll hear from them soon, but not tonight. If you have not registered for a public address, please do so at this time. And our clerk would like to read a comment at this time. Yes, and then we will have Mr. Hill's comments because I know he has, um, mm -hmm. has registered. This comment came in on April 28th from David G. Safewright of 306 Griffith Street in Thomasville. His comment is, I, David G. Safewright, a constituent of Davidson County, am writing a public comment in reference to agenda item 9c resolution refugee settlement in davidson county i am against the proposed resolution and encourage my county commissioners to vote against the resolution before refusing to accept settlement of refugees in davidson county all commissioners should consider the following which is from the catholic social teaching on immigration and the movement of peoples this is in in Quotations, the Israelites' experience of living as homeless aliens was so painful and frightening that God ordered his people for all time to have special care for the alien. You shall treat the alien who resides with you no differently than the natives born among you. Have the same love for him as for yourself, for you too were once aliens, aliens in the land of Egypt. The New Testament begins with Matthew's story of Joseph and Mary's escape to Egypt with their newborn son, Jesus because the paranoid and jealous King Herod wanted to kill the infant. Our Savior himself lived as a refugee because his own land was not safe. Jesus reiterates the Old Testament command to love and care for the stranger, a criterion by which we shall be judged. 
For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. A stranger, and you welcomed me. The Apostle Paul asserts the absolute equality of all people before God. There is neither Jew nor Greek, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. In Christ, the human race is one before God, equal in dignity and rights. End of the quotations. We should welcome refugees in our county, not turn refugees away. Please vote against Agenda Item 9C, Resolution Refugee Settlement in Davidson County. And Debbie, before we continue, I think we need to adopt the agenda first. I think I've got it out of order. (laughs) Okay, are there any changes to the agenda? May I have a motion and a second to adopt the agenda? Second. Have a motion and a second? I have a motion and a second. All in favor? If we could do roll call again. Roll call. We're going to do roll call again. Okay. Commissioner Crock? Yes. Commissioner Elliott? Yes. Commissioner McClure? Yes. Commissioner Shell? Yes. Vice Chair Truel? Yes. Yes. Commissioner Yates? Yes. Chair Watford? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Madam Clerk, is the change for the library grant included in the consent agenda? We need yes, sir. To, okay, I just want to make sure. Thank you. Okay. Was that, we got uh, the information earlier today that we had updated that just a little bit. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, um, for public address, I'd like to invite Mr. Hill. Mr. Fry, Mr. Hill is the only person that signed up, correct? I think Mr. Shores did as well. Mm-hmm. Okay, then Mr. Shores may be first. He may be first. Thank you, sir. Sorry, went out of order. Mr. Shores, state thank your name, please. You. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is James Shores, and uh, thank you, Commissioners, for uh, allowing me to come in tonight, and uh, it's good to see you all. Uh, I'm here, to, Madam Chair, to speak uh, on in favor of, uh, I believe it was 9D on the agenda tonight, hazard pay for... Uh, uh, the uh, emergency service workers and first responders in Davidson County. Uh, I think this is a, a very good thing. I think it's uh, it's something that is needed. Uh, we have uh, many first responders uh, work through the county, the sheriff's deputies and paramedics, emergency services that uh, that go out each and every day. And 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 I know they their normal job uh, puts their lives on the line. But in this uh, COVID crisis, uh, I think it. it it drastically changes the the, uh, the rules for how, how just how much they're putting uh, their lives on the line. Uh, you've got deputies that come in, into uh, I guess intimate space with people because they have to wrestle with them or or arrest them or or uh, something of this nature. And you have uh, EMS personnel, emergency services personnel that that's you know put in the in the back end of a of an ambulance with these people and and I think it's uh, very important that uh, that the county um, give this hazard pay uh, to to the employees. I'm not going to take up much of your time, Madam Chair. I just wanted to speak in favor of that. I think that uh, there's many people in the county that want that as well, and uh, I think the first responders uh, do an amazing job in this county, and I think that that they deserve this. There's I know there's many other. Agencies, Lexington's doing it. All agencies around us are doing it. Um, High Point, Greensboro, uh, Charlotte, um, Kernersville, many, many agencies are doing this, and I think that uh, that we should do it as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hill. It can just be lowered a little bit. Yes. Thank you. Agenda item nine, Charlie. Mr. Kratz seems determined to provide you a new piggybacking experience each time you meet. How can your refugee resettlement resolution be similar to Beaufort's when yours consists of four fat whereas paragraphs that say the same thing over and over and Beaufort's consists 
of a single sentence. You claim control of refugee resettlement in this county, but only pursuant to Trump's guidelines. That sounds like his coronavirus policy. I believed in refugee resettlement based entirely on individual initiative and private charity long before there was a stable genius in the White House. I still do. Thank you, Mr. Hill. That's all that we have for public comment. Now, going on to item number seven, public hearing, we have a rezoning request by Corey Albright in the Lexington Township containing 0.49 acres, more or less, from RC to HC. I declare the public hearing open, and Mr. Cornman will introduce the application. Good evening. You have a request by Corey Albright to, to rezone 49 hundredths of an Joel acre, more or less, in Lexington Township, tax map 321, lot 32. The property is located on the north side of Arnold Road, approximately 200 feet west of the old U.S. Highway 52 intersection. The address is 134 Arnold Road. Rezoning has requested a change from RC Rural Commercial District to that of HC Highway Commercial District. The Planning Board met on April the 21st and their recommendation was four to one to recommend that this application be denied. Uh, the reasoning being was contained in their consistency statement in that they felt like uh, not all of the uses that are allowed in a highway commercial district would be compatible with the adjoining uh, property owners. Uh, again, uh, the application is being represented tonight by Greer Taylor, who is an uh, attorney with the uh, Grace uh, Law Firm, and she's here tonight to represent her okay. client. Taylor and I represent Corey Albright um, in this rezoning matter. Thank you. Mr. Albright is he's not here. Okay. So are there any questions from the board? Ms. Taylor, you may want to go ahead at this point and make your presentation. Okay. All right. Thank you all so much. Um, last week over the um, planning department's recommendation that it be rezoned as a highway commercial uh, zoning property. Um, the planning board decided otherwise in a four to one vote. I would emphasize that our client, um, first of all, I think that the, the, zone, the zoning and his intended business there are getting a little conflated. Um, the, the current economic um, plan and trajectory of the county is for this to become a major highway corridor into Lexington, making the HC designation appropriate. Um, there was some pushback from some church leaders in the area um, due to one potential intended use by my client to establish a business center that also includes currently legal gaming operations. Um, and some questions by the planning board indicated that they were um, concerned with um, potential um, action on behalf of the sheriffs to enforce any type of statute rendering those operations illegal. Currently, the Supreme Court of North Carolina has enjoined any such action by any sheriff's department locally uh, or across the state, actually. Um, and if any, anything were to ever come of the North Carolina legislature or the court system's decisions regarding the legality of those gaming operations, of course, our client would have to um, cease operating that type of operation. Um, you know, the, 
I believe the representatives from the churches are here again tonight. I would emphasize, you know, that this area already does have a lot of different uses in that little zoning area. Um, there's a gun shop across the street. Um, you know, my client is looking to exercise his constitutional rights to open a legal business at this at this particular place. And um, all the other um, questions that the planning board had last week regarding groundwater um, testing, those types of things, site plans, um, I sent to the planning department and they have forwarded on to you for your review. So if you have any particular questions, I'll be glad to answer. Does anyone have any questions? I, I had, I kept reading through the groundwater discussion and the potential certain areas uh, might be uh, meet some kind of criteria to be over a level mm -hmm. and I, and it seemed to me there might be several places but I, I could never get a clear picture that it was uh, there was not a problem there or there was a problem there so and I've read through it as well and I, it seemed like because of the rising um, water, water table, table mm -hmm. um, you know I think that this would be more of a question for someone down the line um, when this property is being improved about any remediation efforts that are going to that are going to be necessitated. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this has to go through um, multiple layers here. Um, you've got your permitting boards. Your, you know, so things will have to be brought up to a certain standard and a certain code. Mm -hmm. um, I think all of this was provided to to illustrate the point that my client has taken undertaken already a substantial financial commitment to assessing this property, getting it prepared for an improvement. And maintaining that property um, in a in a high degree. So, is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak either in favor for, of or in opposition to this request, Mr. Hill? Contiguity to existing HC just barely missed. All 57 HC uses permitted by right will remain fully available. Nobody even suggested conditional use. The sheer volume of traffic from the road improvements will transform the subject property from de jure RC to de facto HC, whether you choose to recognize that reality or not. Two weeks ago, in deference to an arbitrarily drawn quarter of economic opportunity, this board condemned Chris Reed to stare forever at a vacant lot. Don't slight a genuine opportunity quarter tonight. I support the request. Sir, will you state your name, please? My name is uh, Michael James. I'm on the board of trustees for Ebenezer United Methodist Church. There's several things been addressed so far about this that I think needs to have a hard look at. In the first place, the person that's petitioning for the uh, rezoning, even though the lawyer said he's laid out substantial stuff and made improvements, the improvements, as far as I am able to determine, is ripping out some of the fixtures inside and maybe to reclaim them. He has not mowed the yard at all this year. There's a broken sink next to the front door along with a beer bottle. There's beer bottles on the side. There's water standing in the back next to the building. There's a hole in the roof. There's a hole where a window air conditioning was put into the back wall. 
He has done nothing whatsoever that I can determine to improve the property in any way, in a way that uh, would affect the way the neighbors and everybody passes by it would view as any improvement whatsoever. During the, uh, I spoke at the zoning meeting the last two times that we met, that they met, and uh, last time, last week, in the same room, uh, the lawyer was asked several questions. I would say, by and large, a majority of the answers were she was unaware of exactly what the uh, petitioner plans were, uh, what he would do if the zoning request was denied. Her answer on the first thing about what the use was, she did admit that his full intent at this moment is to put in a gaming operation. That was his intent. And as far as the question about well, what would happen if the rezoning was denied, her answer was, well, he might put in something like a, a Dollar General. The answer was he might, which to me would indicate he has no plans. Because everything else that was asked, and you can check on the minutes yourself and use your own evaluation of it, everything was pretty vague. Uh, my understanding is he paid a fraction of the value, estimated value of the property when he bought it at auction. Uh, I did speak to the sheriff outside and uh, I told him about my concerns about it. And we talked about the impact as far as uh, the sheriff's department was concerned. And he indicated to me that there is, has been serious problems with this kind of uh, operation. And it's been a source of many calls as far as the sheriff's department has had to go to resolve things. Things that would not happen if that business or similar businesses were not there. As far as the location of a business, it's in a service station, or what used to be a service station grocery store. It is located next to the railroad tracks. Part of the property, there was a question as to whether it was on the right of way of a railroad track. So part of the side of the property may not even be usable of the quarter, uh, half acre. On the front of it, you got a, a rural road, not a, not a highway. And the request for zoning concerns changing it from a rural to a, to a highway. That road, on a road, is not a highway. Okay, to give you a better idea of exactly where this property is, if you were to stand on the edge of the property and lean over, you would probably touch the wall of a place of praise, which is a church right in front of Ebenezer Church. It is located on the east side, northeast side of Arnold Road and Leonard Road. And then you got the uh, petitioner's property that is sandwiched between that and the railroad track. And then on the other side of the railroad track, you've got a small area that I doubt very seriously if you were to rezone things like they are right now. There was no way you could put any property on that stretch of property at all. So what you're really looking at when they talk about those other similar businesses for what they're asking to rezone for, the only thing close by is back several hundred feet, you've got the uh, propane company. Okay, then if you turned around and went down Leonard Road, uh, you would have to go down to where the uh, cement company is to get to another business of similar type business. The other thing I would like to mention to, to you besides that kind of business being a nuisance, and everybody knows how much money, how much effort has been spent by the local governments and the state governments to try to curtail this kind of thing. I view of, of the business not from a moral standpoint, 
but from the standpoint that it is absolutely nothing to the county, it is nothing to the city. It is something that if anybody passes by it and they see if they're coming from old Highway 52 and come over railroad tracks, if they see that kind of business immediately on the right and then a church on that corner, and then if you go across the road next to the church, you got Ebenezer United Methodist Church with a big cemetery behind it, and it goes up on one side of it. If they saw that, they would think the same kind of thing I would think. Years ago, I used to travel some for a company, and I used to go from Salisbury down to, uh, I can't think of the name of the place, it's down close to Charlotte. But on that two-lane road, there was a cemetery, and it had a stone wall on either side of the driveway. And there next to that driveway to the cemetery, there was a newspaper thing before you put a newspaper in. And every time I saw it, I thought, well, what is that doing now? It's totally out of place. Well, if you, to me, if you put that, allow that business to exist there, and you come immediately up on two churches, you would think the same thing. Why in the world was that place ever allowed to be there? My question to, to the petitioner to rezone it would be, what were you thinking to think that that would be appropriate to put that kind of business next to a church? Just to refresh your memory, if you go down Arnold Road, I live out in Sherman Oaks off of 150 off of Becker Hill Road, and I come through that road quite often. On the other end of Arnold Road, you've got two expensive housing developments over there after you join in with the road that merges in from, uh, that will take you straight into Welcome. If you come back toward the church, our church, you'll pass by First Alliance Church. If you've ever been over there, that's a, probably one of the biggest churches in the county. And they've made a lot of improvements to that area. Immediately past First Alliance Church, as you're driving down toward uh, New 52, there's a housing development back over to your left. Across the road from it is a brand new house that's just been built. And there's houses all along these roads. And people keep up their property. They got grass lawns and they keep it up. If you come across the uh, new 52, you're going to see a major, a major housing development on the left-hand side. And I, some, some people told me there's 100 or more houses in there. That's Sunset Ridge development. And I think that y'all may have had people come before your board requiring permits for all of this stuff. So you got Sunset Ridge development on that road, and you got uh, the First Alliance Church has been done, uh, Everett Place development, Capstone Crossing development, and besides those, you got seven new homes that have been built in the last year directly on on a road. I'm not trying to tell you what to do. I'm just trying to lay the facts out. To me. The potential directly on that side of the railroad track as far as development and on an adjoining area to Arnold Road, I would not want to mess it up and have people see that and get that kind of impression coming down that road where all these contractors spent all that money and churches have spent years on that road and added to this, this county. The church that I go to, Ebenezer, it dates back, the first title, land title, was 1837. If you come on back up on a road before you get to the intersection of the road that takes you over to Welcome, there's a church on the right-hand side. It's Beulah Church. I don't know if anybody's ever been into it other than me. It's a beautiful sanctuary. It's in a round shape. That church was built by the people that founded the church. They cut the timber off of that land and built that church. Now, that church was built 12 years 
after the Declaration of Independence. It may well be the oldest church in the county, or one of the oldest. So that made it 1788. Now, that church is still active. So is Ebenezer. Our church has a big cemetery behind it. It has family members for over a century have been buried there. Those family members, they got relatives and generations in this county. Across the street from Ebenezer, across on a road, there's a building we use for uh, Methodist men's get together once a month. We also use it for any special meetings where we need kitchen appliances or something like that for cooking. I don't know if the planning board knows about the land that we're talking about, some of this land, especially the land toward the city limits. The land that that building is sitting on, I, I've been told, is about 40 acres. It's owned by the church. If you go straight across Leonard Road on the south side of Arnold Road, that piece of land that's in front of this property we're talking about, I've been told that that property will never be sold to anyone for any purpose as long as those people are alive as friends of that Methodist church. There's another big piece of property across Highway 52. Family members own property over there too. All together, I do not know the exact acreage. I believe it's somewhere around 125 to 150 acres. I was a supervisor. I worked for some major companies. First major company I ever worked for was McGraw Edison as an engineer. I worked for, uh, I came here in 19, around 1977 to work for Duracell as a supervisor. I worked for Leggett and Platt as a supervisor. I worked for Adrian Windows and Doors as a supervisor. Businesses and governments, we can plan for anything we want to. We can come up with an ideal situation. What will happen is depending on which way the trends are going. This county has got a good trend with development on Arnold Road. I do not want this next to my church. I said in the other meetings, I wouldn't want a business like that next to my house, and I sure wouldn't want it next to my church. The easiest thing for a planning board or a zoning board to do is to see the trends and follow the trends. You can always encourage development if it's already started. What we're talking about, about a development corridor, it was mentioned in the uh, zoning board that is uncertain whether it will ever come to fruition because we haven't even planned on or uh, requested from the state, uh, it's my understanding, for the highway to be built to create this corridor. The other thing is, if that highway is widened where it's at, which was what I heard in the meeting, that means you've got to strip a land next to the railroad track that's impractical for any development at all. So it puts all the development on the other side. Okay? If you come across the railroad track, you've got a road that that railroad track is going to interfere with any serious development because how are you going to get access to anything else, any other major road, except to go across the railroad track? So if you develop up uh, Leonard Road toward Welcome, that railroad track is blocking you all as far as getting access back to 52 other than going up toward Winston on that side of it. But that's just the way I look at it. Uh, I could argue based on moral reasons. I could argue on other things, but I do not think it's the best thing for the county. One thing I will tell you, I've lived a long time and I've seen a lot of bad things. I was in Vietnam. I had a boy that was 
same age as I was. I grew up with on a cotton mill village in Roxborough. And uh, when we were about nine years old, his father drove a car into the city late and committed suicide. It was because of gambling, and his mother was about to lose the house because the payments weren't being made. I grew up in a family where my dad got drunk six nights a week. These gaming situations, they take money out of accounting. And what anybody that works in business will tell you, money that's generated within the county due to businesses, if that money stays in the county, it will generate about four and a half dollars for every dollar that's created to start with. And the reason being because they spend money on employees, employees turn around and uh, buy stuff. The company they buy from, they pay their employees, their employees go and buy stuff. So it's about four and a half dollars for every dollar that's created. This business is by somebody else that I think is outside of the county. It's strictly cash. It's not, the people go in and out and use that business when they go home at night, they will not be carrying anything physical to their homes for their families. I think it's all negative. I think it will take away. And what was said by the lawyer at the last meeting was that the person petitioning for this all, would never do anything that's against the law. We all know that governments see these businesses as being problem businesses for the kind of people, kind of incidents that happen. And it really doesn't add to the, the growth of the county or the city at all. So I would urge you to vote against it, not only because of how I might feel about it, but I hope you take into consideration some of the things that I brought up. And then also the uh, zoning board, their vote of four to one against it. There's a reason that we have a zoning board as to make recommendations. It doesn't mean you have to follow the recommendations, but it should be considered, in my opinion. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Sir, sir can I ask you a quick question? Sure. I'm having trouble looking, reading this, this map. It's not what we typically have, Guy. What, where is this piece of property? Which one is it? If you go, okay, the I'll piece put, of property is right next to the railroad track as soon as you come off of 52. It's the old, it's the old uh, it's the grocery old, store. Oh, it's Hampton store? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And it has a big awning out front. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I just I couldn't quite get my bearings here. All right. But I'm not. Now, if something else came up, and please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. When she was asked, the lawyer was asked about potential how many people might be in the building at one time. I think the answer was could be said, probably more likely to be 30. Is this correct? Yeah, that would all have to be determined based on how many people would it be determined based on parking availability. It would be determined based on a lot of factors that the board, the board, and the board. You, you did say that typically that business that he runs that kind of. That, that's all. That's all very situation dependent and dependent on the size of the facility. When you bring that up, you take this half acre profit. You consider. If part of the parking lot next to the railroad track belongs to the railroad and they're very particular about yeah. any use you make of their property. In fact, that the highway department has got a right of way in the front of it that the board is on to. You start with Jesus sir, sir, building, sir I could I ask you to speak into the mic yeah. so they can hear you if you're going to speak? Thank you. I hadn't heard anything you said in the last five minutes. <laughs> I'm sorry. The question came up about where the property was located, and then I brought up about how many people might be in a building at one time as from the information that was given to the zoning committee. And the property is located, if you're coming from uh, Lexington City Limits, and you come up to the intersection of Arnold Road and Old Highway 52, on your right-hand side is the gun store. If you take a left at that stoplight, 
across the railroad tracks. The property in question is on the right hand side adjoining the railroad tracks. Then on the immediately on the other side of it, and that building is 30, approximately 30 feet from the place of praise church. Because I went out and stepped it all. I say approximately, I, it's only going to be a few feet off one way or the other. It may be less, maybe a little more. And then on the other side of the place of praise, you have uh, Leonard Road. Immediately I'm across. I'm that now. Yeah, yeah, we got it. Okay. We got it. We got it. But yeah, I got it. Uh, I mentioned that the fact is that the railroad may have right away on part of the parking lot, which is part of the property for this mm -hmm. place is asked to be rezoned. Also, you got the highway that they have that right away. So you reduce the size of it. Then if you talk about any quantity of people at all in the building, I'm not sure you're going to have any place to park cars. So, uh, and then... Right now, the only thing that's been said that sounds like he's leaning toward anything is toward uh, a game in place. Okay. And I said earlier about problems with uh, police having to come to this kind of establishment, and I was talking to the sheriff yeah. outside mm -hmm. tonight. Yeah. And if you'd like to, I'm sure he'd be glad to address potential problems with that kind of business. I don't. It's up to him and y'all. Yeah. Thank, thank you, thank you Mr. Thank James. You so Appreciate it. Thank you. And then pass Madam the Chairman. Place of praise, like okay. Sorry. Yeah, I'm here for questions. Okay. I'm uh, uh, Pastor Mike Lane. Uh, I uh, pastor of Place Praise Church. Uh, this is, I think, the third time we've been here, and so I'm going to keep it short because I've got the same story. Um, the um, When I'm not pastoring, I, I can teach school. I teach at North High, North Middle, Oak Grove High, Oak Grove Middle, and I, uh, uh, I, and I, I really like it. And uh, I know this about children. Children are influenced, and uh, our, our parking lot, a place of praise, is 30 feet uh, from that store. And by the way, on that store, for three years, our church kept that, that place mowed, weeded, because we have spent something like $200,000, and our, our church is nice. We've renovated it. And, uh, and we try to keep that place looking good because it looks so terrible. Because it took away from ours. Mm -hmm. uh, there's trees growing out the gutter. Uh, and anyway, uh, and our children have car washes, and uh, there's a there's a lot of traffic right there, and there's a lot of children that lives in those new house developments and the old house developments. And I know this that uh, children are easily influenced, and I think in my heart the question is. Is this is it good for the community? Um, seems like people in Davidson County are very community minded, and uh, I, I like Davidson County. It's a, it's a good place to live, and uh, I'm not here to to be a little anybody for wanting to have a business or anything like that. That's not what it's about. Uh, I'm just best interest of uh, of our community and our children and their future. Um, these kids now, um, that's 10 and 11 and five years, they're going to be driving. Uh, kids in middle school is going to be graduating, and they're going to be going to places maybe they don't need to be going. And I, I think this what's best for the community. And uh, But anyway, I want to appreciate this board for giving us the opportunity to speak to you. And for the representative from uh, Methodist Church, I appreciate what he said. Uh, and I was thinking, I can't say anything that I've already said the last two times. Um, I, I know this. Um, that it, this is a good area. And, and I will go back to saying this. When people, I know people, before me and my wife bought our place up in Welcome, our home, 
we own the house in Forsyth County. I know a lot of people in Winston. There's people driving to Lexington for the candy store. They love it. People come down here because they love our barbecue. <laughs> uh, everybody knows that. Highway 8 is the main thoroughway. Anybody coming from north. I don't care if it's from Mount Airy or Winston-Salem or King. And and uh, I, I really think our, our community deserves something that's more attractive. When people come down the interstate and get off on Highway 8, the first thing they need to see is something, a good thing. So that's that's my story, and uh, and I appreciate your time, okay? Thank you, sir. I really do. I got one question for you. Yes, sir? Was this property sold at an auction? Is that what I heard just a few minutes ago? That property? Yes. The, the store? Yeah, actually, it was. I, I actually went down and bid it on it. Uh, my bid was limited because we're not that big a congregation. Uh, they was, I think that day, it was an open bid. I think there was 10 of us. And uh, my bid stopped at 29500 That property, that property, when the owners left, uh, a real estate company had it, and they had that property up. If, don't quote me on this because it's been about five years. I think they had it on the market for $239,000, something like that. Well, when they foreclosed on it, naturally, uh, uh, we went down in bid, um, and it started out with 10000 <laughs> My bid stopped at 29500 because that's, that's, that's all we had in the bank. Uh, and at that time, there was about four of us left. Now, what exactly they got it for, I can't honestly say. I have heard it was something in the mid-50s, but, you know, that's not written in stone. I'm not sure. I really don't know. But I do know this. It was an open bid, and uh, uh, 29500 didn't get it because would, I would have bought it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. I heard that one ago. I mm -hmm. see where that's good. So. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I want, I want to thank you for your time. Thank I really you. mean that. Thank you. Is there anyone else to speak um, in favor of or in opposition to this request? Do you have anything else to say? I would just like to say that our client is committed to improving this property. The rezoning request is obviously the first step in how he determines how he can ultimately use the property, be it as as, as any type of um, business operation. So um, obviously this is our first step. He does remain committed, um, and I do appreciate the concerns that were voiced. Um, however, we still stand by that this is currently a legal operation. If it was ultimately determined, to be used as a gaming operation. And, you know, I think that that's something that has to be taken into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cornman or Mr. Mr. Hill. Okay. Can you let me previously during the planning board uh, meeting that the man has only owned it a couple years. He doesn't want to. He doesn't want to pin himself down to anything um, until he sees whether the rezoning is going to go through. He is not obligated to explain to the public as long as he's within that range of uses. General uses um, in HC, what he's going to do with it, he doesn't have to know what he's going to do with it himself. And uh, all these things have been brought up of uh, how well he's maintained it under RC completely irrelevant. Um, it's his property. He bought it. It's, uh, if anybody else had wanted to uh, 
pay a little more dearly for it. The best way to, the, the only legitimate way to control a piece of property is to buy the property. And as to the uh, stigma of people who are customers of this type of establishment that somebody has uh, assumed this is going to turn into, they are fiercely loyal. Um, they're not asking for any government subsidy. They're not making any noise. They're not raising any dust. And uh, the uh, the uh, traffic situation. You can uh, you can use your imagination to make that into anything you want to. So uh, I wish these churches that are that are opposing it. By the way. Nobody asked any questions when it was a, when this when the session was coming to an end. Nobody actually opposed it as such. Um, but a little little bit of uh, Christian giving people the benefit of a doubt. Mr. Cornman, are you? Does anyone else have anything to add? I'll, I'll call you back. I think Justin broke the mic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, you know, Get your pump. Uh, We're going to bring up our corridor. Pardon? And I'm not going to be muffled. <laughs> I got a question, guys. Some yes, sir. Not highway commercial already? It's rural commercial. It's our Next slide. It's rural rural commercial. commercial. Highway commercial is just a little bit more intensive than rural commercial. There's some other things like auditorium. Yeah, everything, and some everything was supposed to be used. Okay. For some reason, I was looking at it as rural What I wanted to bring up to you is it's been alluded to that there is a lot of new residential development occurring to the western side of the old 52 corridor. So in the long range planning, we certainly see a lot of commercial development happening in this particular uh, commercial corridor of old 52. Uh, as you see, we have a large uh, track here that's uh, a farm. Uh, eventually that could possibly be a shopping center at some point in time. Uh, it probably would need sewer brought to it, to the area, but uh, the closest sewer is just to the west of this corridor. It runs through Sunset Ridge and on up to Welcome and crosses 52 up there, uh, I think, at the uh, Welcome Elementary School and then goes on over to uh, the Childress uh, development. But we already have Highway Commercial at the gun store, which has already been mentioned. Uh, you have some highway commercial here. This is, I believe, is the old Matt Supply Store. Uh, a lot of that's already zoned commercial. Uh, you have some uh, limited industrial going east on City, uh, City, City Lake Road. Uh, that was the uh, print craft uh, and uh, Nicholson uh, trucking terminals out there. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then to the further the south is uh, heavy industrial. Uh, that was part of the uh, brule lumber supply and some of the old, older uh, uh, supply uh, uh, house that was there. Uh, since then, the gobble uh, concrete's located in some of those buildings. But um, we we foresee this corridor to uh, develop commercially and it would, as a service to the uh, increasing uh, residential development that's occurring further to the west on Arnold Road. Where's the gun store at again? I'm, I'm All right, it, it it's directly there. across the highway right here. I hate to say that. Yeah, right there. Right oh yeah, that's it there. Mm -hmm. That's Freddie Sink store. 
Commissioner Yates, if you could speak up to the mic and hear you. Yeah, I just kind of lost my bearings there for a minute where we was at, but I got it. Exactly where that building was at, but I know now. Yes, sir. And here. Mr. Cornman, will you restate the reason again that the board well, voted 4 1? Sure. Again, this is not a conditional use request. This is a general district request. And so you do have to think about all of the uses that are allowed in a HC highway commercial district. That uh, the board, uh, after hearing the concerns that were raised at the uh, their level, they they recommended it be denied four to one. Uh, but staff is still recommending approval of the request based on the uh, corridors map. And Josh, if you'll sh bring that. It's pretty much self-explanatory. Yeah. You have a copy of your of the. Yeah, I know what kind of commercial property is up to. Yeah. Mm, yeah. But it's uh, a rather large uh, commercial uh, node there, uh, and as O52 is considered a, uh, a corridor. Uh, there are plans to eventually upgrade this. Uh, uh, Four lane, five lane, whatever. Yeah, and uh, bring it to uh, from I-285 down to uh, the new Winston Road that will start soon. And uh, we do have, I'll mention, we do have a couple of policy statements that encourage uh, uh, support of the uh, rezoning from uh, our economic development uh, policy statement uh, 1.5 and 5.7. 1.5 says economic development efforts should encourage the revitalization and reuse of, of currently unused or underutilized structure sites and infrastructures in appropriately located areas. And then policy 5.7 states that commercial uses should be encouraged to develop by consideration and expansion of existing commercially zoned property when such consolidation or expansion does not encroach upon viable residential areas. I tell you what, uh, you know, as far as they're putting that game in place there or whatever, that's I guess that's up to the buyer what he puts in there if it's legal, kind of like Mr. Hill said. Uh, what I would like staff to look into, if we're going to uh, permit or zone these type places, and I think me and the manager has talked about it before, some type of, uh, of taxing for these machines. Uh, we need something in place. If we're going to let them come here, we need to have taxing for them. So I know that's a different discussion for another night, but... Yeah. Well, uh, Mr. Yates, uh, you, at your last meeting, you approved a contract with uh, Region G Council and Government, and uh, these uh, gaming places was one of the, the 11 items that we wanted to take a closer look at and see what some of the other counties are doing with these, uh, and we could look at it at that time. I, mean, I know they probably deal with a lot of cash, so you have to tax the machine. I mean, I've, I've read somewhat about in different places, but like I said, that's not for this meeting, but I'm saying sure. Yeah. If they're not legal, then that would be up to the sheriff and uh, mm -hmm. ALE or whatever to, to, to go in if they're not legal establishment, not us. But that's my opinion. Mr. Gorman, what's the distance between the church and this building, the building itself? Or is it just, can you tell me, between it and the property? 30, 30 feet. feet. Yes, ma'am. That building probably was, I, I, I'm pretty sure of this, I think the original building before the church uh, uh, added on to it was probably used for some sort of commercial use uh, previously. And the, You actually uh, had two churches there. The uh, grocery store, I understand, was actually where uh, Freddie Stink had his original gun store years ago. And then he expanded across the street, across the highway. So you say the church that's there now was a commercial building before? I'm thinking it was. Made it into a church. 
But there's one across Leonard Road there, Ebenezer. Yeah, that that's an original that's church. There. And then the other one's a smaller, like smaller church. But it on the map, it's beyond the picture, right? Ebenezer Church is right there. Oh, that's Ebenezer. Okay. I wanted to make sure that what I told you was correct. I was going to ask the pastor if he could explain what your building was prior to the church. Well, it was um, used to be a gun store. Okay. Okay. I think it was a gun store across the street. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it used to be that. And uh, if you'll speak into the microphone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, we can't hear the conversation. But it, it, I know it used to be a gun store. And uh, the other part, the metal part, when we bought it, it was just an empty garage, like you know. So, but the last thing I think that I know of, it, it, it was the gun store. Okay. The, uh, when that other building was built, when that other building was built, right. Madam Chair. Yes, sir. Um, when that other building was built, it had um, it was built for storage, and the guy that built it was the guy that owned the crossroads at the time, and he used it for kind of a warehouse thing. And then whenever he moved out, Freddie Sink opened it up in there as a gun store, and then he moved across the street. But that's that, that, you know I live right down the road from City Lake, and and that's what it was. And while I'm talking, if Commissioner Yates can get up to the microphone, I can't hear him at all. Uh, this off. How about <laughs> now? <laughs> hey, that's great. Is that <laughs> Madam Chairman, this is Troll. Can I ask a question? Yes, sir. Okay, this question would be for Jack. Uh, I realize tonight that we're not discussing the business, we we're discussing a change in the uh, RC to AC. And when when they brought the game, good. Mm -hmm. Don, hold on just a minute. Um, come up to the come up to your microphone and stay at your microphone, okay, so we can hear you, okay? This is one of them cheap Walmart microphones. That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it cost you six dollars. But my question was this: I know we're not talking about a business. We're talking about uh, changing the uh, restriction of uh, the RC to AC. Uh, but when we talk about, they brought up the, the gentleman talking about the gaming room. Uh, it really, it, what stuck in my mind, he said that he could almost lean over from his property and touch this gaming room. Uh, you know, isn't there for gaming rooms or these type of bits, don't they have to be a certain distance from a church or a school or these type of things? That was for Guy. That, I don't know if he knows or not. Commissioner Truel, uh, there is no uh, regulations under the current zoning ordinance that requires any separation, but that was one of the things that we wanted to revisit. We actually brought this uh, in front of the board about three years ago at an informational meeting, and at that time the uh, board just didn't give us any direction to move towards any changes to the ordinance. But since that time, we have had a growing number of these to uh, locate in the county. And so we felt like now was a, uh, a good time to bring it back up and take a look at it again. I understand. Thank you. Hey, Guy? Yes, sir. Fred McClure. Yes, sir. In the arts. Isn't the RC, uh, isn't that part of uh, uh, the commercial corridor as well? It is. Okay. 
And the, the problem with the HI is that this this kind of business don't really fit into the HI category. Because yes. if you read the list of the occupancies in the HI, they're a whole lot more invasive than this particular property is. Absolutely. So it's really not a, co a commercial corridor piece of property. I mean HI. Are you ready for a motion, Madam Chairwoman? I think we are. Is everyone ready? Madam Chair, you would, will you close the public? We might have some more discussion. Way. I didn't know he was going to make a motion. Okay, hold on a second. Well, that's why I was asking. Um, well, you go ahead and make a motion in a second, and then we'll talk about well, it. Well, let, uh, let me close the hearing, first of all, okay? Now, do I have, do I have a motion? So moved. What's, what, motion? what's your motion, Mr. Kratz? Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> my motion is to deny the request just as the planning and uh, zoning board had did and accept their uh, statement of consistency. Do I have a second? A second. All right. We'll have a roll call vote. I was looking for my clicker. Oh, me too. <laughs> okay. Okay. We will do a roll call, and this is to deny... So a yes vote would be to uh, uh, agree with the denial. Commissioner Crotts? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Elliott? Yes. Commissioner McClure? Yes. Commissioner Shell? Yes. Vice Chair Truel? Yes. Yes. No. Chair Watford? Yes. Madam Clerk, are you going to announce the results of that? Yes. Yes, sir. I, I, I was waiting. <laughs> that motion carries by a vote of six to, six to one. Without our visuals and our clickers, we're confused. <laughs> we're, in a, we're in a new world. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen, and thank, thank you, ma'am, for coming in. Thank you. We appreciate it. All right. Item number eight. These are the items for decision, information, and consent. Uh, if you've had time to look, are there any items to remove from the consent agenda for discussion? Hearing none, may I have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda? I thought I heard one. I'll make a motion to approve. Consent. Motion to approve, Mr. Yates. Second. Second. Second, Mr. Elliott. Roll call again, please. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Crott? Yes. Commissioner Elliott? Yes. Commissioner McClure? Yes. Commissioner Shell? Yes. Chair Truel? Hi. Yes. Commissioner Yates? Uh, yes. Chair Watford? Yes. That motion carries by a vote of 7 to 0. All right. Item number nine now for decision and deliberation. First of all, Casey's going to lead off the health benefits update. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. It's that time of the year where we have to get our benefits plan together for next fiscal year. Um, I want to thank Commissioner uh, McClure and Commissioner Crotts for once again helping us through uh, this year as we as we all met a couple of times to get our kind of squared away. Our folks from USI are here, Larry Reese and Linda Klein. I'm going to invite them in, or they're already here. I'm going to turn this over to them um, to walk you through next year's plan. Um, good evening. Good Thank evening. you for, uh, for allowing us to be here. Mm -hmm. um, we are here to discuss your employee benefit renewals for up, up uh, My name is Larry, Larry Reese, and this is my colleague, Linda Klein. Um, we have the pleasure of um, being with you guys for a while now. It's good, good to see everyone. Uh, I'll just jump right in. Right. Sure. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. And, uh, can't see me. Maybe you all visually see us. I'm, I'm not I'm not Larry, sure. would you step up closer to step the mic? Step up to the mic because... I can see you, Larry. They yeah. can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh -huh. um, so uh, our agenda for our time together today is to... Uh, these are the coverages that are up for renewal. Your basic life insurance where the county provides to all employees a flat $10,000 benefit. We were able to um, 
Negotiate a 0% increase with Voya and a two-year rate guarantee. Um, Your medical and dental, there's no increase to the fees or to the premium on the dental. Um, It's under a rate guarantee. And then so I think for the discussion today is the self-funded forecast for your medical and pharmacy employee benefit coverage. Um, And it's the same two plan designs. We have forecasted starting in July, your fiscal year, a 9% increase. Uh, There are two plan design changes that uh, a couple of the uh, commissioners, uh, Commissioner McClure, Commissioner Kratz, uh, Casey staff and team have worked through with Linda and I uh, the recommendations before uh, you today. And in order to get that increase down, there were two suggested program changes. Uh, one is a change to the pharmacy coverage. It's, it's a concept called net results. Um, it tweaks the program just a little bit, and I'm going to walk you through it. And then there's a specialty copay program that uh, allows manufacturer coupons and rebates to come to the county. Uh, so we're recommending those two things. Is there a reason we don't have a copy of what you're reading off of? Uh, it was provided in the pre-material. It's part of the agenda packet, Mr. Shell. Yeah, but uh, uh, it's hard for me to listen to him and read at the same time if I had to. If you guys will give, if you'll give me a couple of minutes, I can print some. No, that's Do we okay. Have that's okay. okay. I can get it later. Okay. I can get okay. it later. Um, we might have Linda might be able to give you her copy. Uh, Linda might be able to give you her copy. And then if you'll accept, I don't know what the rules are for hand and whatever rules he wants, if he wants it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hope it ain't got Corona. <laughs> <laughs> Here you go, bro. She had her mask on like the, um, like the governor yeah, we, of Florida. Was uh, there. Right. Is, that, is that helpful to you? We're um, still on, on the, okay, is that better? Nope, nope, nope. I, uh, I didn't think I had it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the last thing on page one, and, and the, what would come in combination with this for the employee premiums, uh, no increase. So that will be two years in a row, no increase to the um, employees. And I'll move us to page two. And, I'll, I'll boy, this is busy. I know that's hard to see. I'll bottom line you, it's a 6.8%. I guess I kind of gave that away on the agenda, but it's a 6.8% increase to the bottom line. Um, and if, if um, you do these two changes, and I'll move to page three and discuss that change real quick. Net results and specialty copay max. So this is not a plan design change. Net results is essentially a formulary change. And there are a few drugs. Um, that would move to a different tier. So instead of a $10, it would be a $30. But there is a different drug in the same class that does the same thing. It's a Pepsi Coke kind of thing. And if the people that are taking drinking the Coke will move over to the Pepsi, it's still 10 bucks. But if they want to stay on Coke, that's perfectly their uh, you know right to do. But now it's $30. Okay? And then um, that is a savings of $162,000. And you'll notice in in the um, material, page three off to the right, there are 65 members who would be impacted by that higher copay change. And then there are 66 members who would go through a prior authorization. And that's, for lack of a better word, a little bit of mother may I, um, right? So there's a process to do that. And just to put it in perspective, these 65 and 66 members, your plan, and when I say a member, I'm talking about a belly button. So it's an employee, a spouse, a child, so your program covers 1,454 members, and, and the, this change would impact uh, about 65 on one piece and 66 on the other. So pretty, pretty minimal impact. And we have quite a few of our clients. Probably a third of our clients are already doing this, and I would say uh, another 15, 20% of them will be doing it July 1. And I bet you the rest will, will follow on on January 1. Um, net results for Blue Cross Blue Shield has been around about three years now, maybe four. The next program I'm going to speak briefly about is called the Specialty Copay Max Program. It's been around about a year. Um, this program, uh, Prime Therapeutics, that's on your card, on your ID card with Blue Cross Blue Shield, it says Prime Therapeutics. What they do is they match uh, manufacturer rebates that are coupons that are available. So you might have a member taking a drug. In fact, you do. You have six members taking a drug. And the sooner we get these, excuse me, that says eight. As soon as we get these eight members enrolled in the program, the county will start saving $103,000. This is just money on the table right now. Now, how long the, the manufacturers of pharmaceuticals keep these programs, I don't know. But let's get it while we can get it. 
and um, I've got about every client I've got doing this program as fast as we can get it in. Prompt Therapeutics was one of the later to do it. They've, like I said, they've had this program maybe about a year, maybe less, but it's, I would highly recommend this program. For the eight people that are impacted, it's going to take them about 20 minutes of their time on the phone with somebody from Prime Therapeutics walking them through the application process. They're handheld to do it. So um, that's that program. So uh, the next page, page four, gives you a little bit of a deeper dive on that result. So this says there were 9,300, in case you were interested, 9,321 claims uh, during the time period studied, which is only six months, so six months of claims. And during that time, there would be 195 drugs that would have a negative tier impact if those members didn't change to an otherwise available drug on tier one and tier two. And so those 195 drugs come from 65 different utilizers. And you get the hang of it. Same thing on the 168. So we're just trying to quantify it for you. A little bit of impact, I think 4%, 35 to 4% impact, depending on the program. And then the specialty is only eight members out of 1,400. Um, the next page is Teladoc. You already have Teladoc, and so that's the easy way these days to get an appointment. Um, in, in fact, we've had clients doing this for a while. Y'all have been doing it for a while, and, the, and we're going to show you a little bit of success that you're having. Today, there is a chance to add behavioral health, and in order to add behavioral health, I think the cost, it goes up 20 cents. It goes from $1.15 to a dollar. Yeah, Linda, she's got the numbers down. So it goes to a dollar thirty. It's twenty cents, and so the twenty cents is two thousand dollars annualized based on your head count. That's that's the numbers. Um, the next page walks you through Teladoc utilization. So um, this is pretty good, and I I know that uh, Commissioner McClure likes to know what's going on with Teladoc, and so I'd say it's going pretty well. Y'all have gone from twenty six all the way up to eighty three. And again, this is the, this is, we would highly recommend it. First thing you got to do is download the app on your phone. And then, then after you download, that's probably the hardest thing to do is download the app and sign up because you got to register. But once you've done that, you can have an appointment in, in five minutes. Um, and that appointment's 15 bucks. Um, so utilization is good. It's gone from 26 visits to 83. That's a 40% increase. And, and that's thanks to, uh, staff here in the HR department on all the promotional work to get that out and, and get folks signed up for Teladoc. Now, the next page is a busy numbers page, but, uh, but I think m most folks have seen this busy numbers page before. This essentially is how the money divides up. So that, uh, that $11.7 million budget, how's it kind of shake out? And it's a composite increase of 6.8 with the two plan design changes or two program, no plan design, two program changes. Um, and if the employees, it, it, if the good of the group, the will of the board is for the employees not to have an increase, then the county would pick up 8%. And that is the recommendation that, that came from USI, the committee, and staff. Um, I'll move us over to page 8. Uh, the life insurance with Voya, I just thought I'd share the details. We kind of already covered it on page 1. It's a zero increase. It's a $0.10 cent rate. And the annual, the annual premium is $24,000. So I, I tried to do that as expeditiously as I, as I could. I uh, hope, hope that is helpful, and I will um, take questions, turn it over to the board. Lin Linda, did, how did I do? Okay, good. Excellent. Is, yeah. there any, is there any provisions being made or considered? Uh, this is a question, and it is related to our health insurance. Yes, sir. Sorry, Fred. I got away from the mic. Is there any provisions being made for example, if, if a patient, a, a, a client has met their deductible, but they can't get service, they're supposed to have a procedure, and it falls within the time they've already met their deductible, but they can't get service. Is there any, anybody looking at that problem? Um, interesting. So we did do some forecasting. Everybody thought the coronavirus was going to cost a lot of money, and um, it, it conceivably could. Uh, but things could have also gone the exact opposite way, which is kind of the, the point you're making. Um, because of coronavirus, a lot of people who had elective procedures scheduled are not able to have those procedures. Um, so claim cost is a self-funded plan sponsor. Uh, your, your claim cost might be lower. And we ran some models where if corona really hit, if you had an outbreak, claims would really you know, be above what we had originally forecasted. If you didn't have an outbreak, but yet all the hospitals and elective procedures were delayed or postponed, 
um, then your claims costs would go down. I think the question you're asking is, hey, well, that's great for the self-funded plan sponsor, but what about the consumer who, you know, prior to March 15th had, had already met their deductible? Um, we had not contemplated that. That's something that you could contemplate doing. Uh, it, it, it is not within the uh, budget numbers that you have in front of you relative to a forecast for claim costs for the upcoming fiscal year. Um, Pretty much between the, the, the patient and his doctor. I'm sorry? That scheduling is pretty much between you rule and the pay as long as the doctor does the procedure. Well, that's that's right. Yeah. You're exactly right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I don't have this insurance because I have something else, but I'm just asking a question. Yeah. It was supposed to go up 9%, and then you did these changes that dropped it down to 6.8. 6.8. Yes, ma'am. Okay. okay. That's good. Yeah. That's good, <laughs> that's good for the it, consumer. It's real good. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, what did we go good. up last year, Casey? It was, um, it was almost 8 or 9 last year. And so this so year we're going up an additional 6.8. Yes, mm -hmm. And the industry standard's usually being 6 to 7. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's kind of the to see with the claims. That's one of the reasons why we continually do the plan changes. Right. You know, we, we talk about this every year as a group. You know, we try our best not to make radical plan changes that get that get on the employees. But um, it becomes to where you can't. It's an it's a mathematics. Is all I just wonder at what point they price themselves out of the market. <laughs> People can't it, afford it. Yeah. I mean, it's it's an ongoing battle every year. Especially uh, now when they can't get half the benefits of insurance because they can't go into the hospital and get surgeries. Mm -hmm. and, you know, they're mm -hmm. losing a lot of benefits with yeah. insurance. So, And like I say, 7 or 8% a year is a pretty nice increase. I'm not blaming the people who work for the insurance companies. I'm just saying that yeah, eventually you're gonna get to, they're going to get to the point where they price themselves out of the market. People can't afford it. Uh, yeah, yes, you're 100% right. I mean, we're... It, it's a U.S. problem. I mean, trends in healthcare is seven, eight, nine percent. Specialty pharmacy, y'all specialty pharmacy is pretty reasonable. Ph pharmacy is going to chew eighty percent of the bill. So you're spending eleven point six million dollars. Used to be pharmacy was fifteen to twenty percent of that. Pharmacy is moving towards fifty. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's really of that fifty percent, specialty is fifty percent of that. You know, all that nine thousand I showed you, nine thousand prescriptions over six months. That's that's eighty seven, eighty eight percent generic drugs. And I don't want it to sound like I'm blaming the insurance company for all this because I'm not. The the cost has been manufactured in the healthcare industry, and uh, to over overcome those who don't have insurance. And I understand why that is, but eventually the people who do have, I'm not gonna have anymore. And you see that already with the uh, cable television. The market, you know, where you got one company that buys up all the rest of them so they can eliminate the competition. Then you got it's price fixing, clear as simple, you know, mm. and they do that. And the same thing's happening in the healthcare industry. But people just sit back and say, it's all right, you know, they work hard. And, you know, I work hard too, and so does the other because <laughs> uh, people out here, in the, out here in the community, you know, and eventually they're going to price themselves out of the market. It's just that clear. You know, there's no way around it because the salaries can't keep up. Right. You know, the mortgages go up, the, everything goes up. Groceries and everything, is, they just don't have the money. And, and the thing about it is this price comes with health, health risk assessments, you know, background checks on employees, seeing if you're diabetic, do you have a history mm -hmm. of uh, smoking to, for us to get this this best thing and it, it is it's around it's everywhere i mean we run a yeah. wellness program and this yeah. is still, it's still yeah that's what i'm saying if we didn't have the wellness program it would even be worse that's y'all have a legacy y'all y'all been early adopt that's why i want you to do net results because that's probably the first thing you want an early adopter on y'all had a great 10-year run of getting out in front of things and staying in front and that's why your increase i i, I know that that's expensive but we have trends seven, eight, and nine. You should expect every year seven, eight, and nine. So a win here at six, eight is a self-funded plan sponsor. That's pretty strong, and it's a tribute to a ten-year track track record of of doing the right things. But I got a question: How many years can you go seven, eight, or nine? I know. You know that's not sustainable. Mm -mm. Uh, it's, it's not to the general public now. So. There is a concept called orphan drugs, and I, I know a couple of your colleagues know it well because they're in this business. And if you get unlucky and you end up with an orphan drug. One member costs a million bucks a year. Mm -hmm. One member. 
and they can live an otherwise healthy lifestyle. And I think there's 23 orphan drugs right now. So it's a bit like struck by lightning, but it's it's the wrong door prize to win. Yeah, you're exactly that's, right. I mean, that's really the name going, of the game with this. Is and I've learned this over the years from hanging out with Larry. Is twelve million dollar? We're running a twelve million dollar insurance company out of our organization, but just a small group of people can actually affect the cost of it. You know, and things are getting so specialized that the drugs get more expensive. You know, we get something what forty percent of our organization pre diabetic, um, and that's with running a wellness program. So it's it's tough, um, but I hear you. The cost increases are. I mean, like I say, seven or eight or nine percent right. is un, unsustainable right. to the average citizen. Out right. They can't afford. Mm-hmm. I got a friend of mine now paying fifteen hundred a month for him and his family. You know. Mm. Oh yeah, if you're if it, your individual co- group coverage is it protects you. If your individual coverage, you can get bad fast. Mm-hmm. Fifteen hundred a month. I mean, not many people can afford that for insurance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For one kid right. and one wife. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. anyhow. Well, if do I have any other questions? If I do want to let you all know, the numbers you're seeing here, this plan and the budget it takes to run it, this is what's included in what you're going to get in the budget in two weeks from now. Right. Um, so mm-hmm. just so you know, it's this is where we are, um, given not making any more changes to the plan or anything. New policy picks up in July. July 1, right. Okay. right. Do I have a motion and a second to accept and approve the 2020 health benefits package? Fred, Fred McClure, I'll make that motion. Mr. McClure, do I have a second? Yes, I'll second it. Okay, Mr. Crotz, second. All in favor, we'll have a vote. Roll call again. <laughs> Commissioner Crotz? Yes. Commissioner Elliott? Yes. Commissioner McClure? Yes. Commissioner Shell? Yes. Vice Chair Trull? Yes. Commissioner Gates? Yes. Chair Watford? Yes. That motion carries by vote of 7 0. Thank you. Thank you for your, for your time. presentation. Thank you all thank very you. much. Well, thank, thank you, Larry and Linda. They're, they're Larry, thanks for listening yeah. to me. Thank yes, sir. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Larry's who's here wore out of the day. <laughs> 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 Okay, we, uh, Mr. Fry is going to lead off the approval of documents with Unilin on the conveyance of property. Madam Chair, members of the board, in May of 2004, Davidson County entered into an economic development incentive contract with Unilin, which provided, among other things, for the county to acquire a piece of property and then over the next 14 years to lease that property back to Unilin pursuant to the terms of the economic development incentive contract. The terms of that lease were satisfied in December of 2018 and all of the lease payments were made by Unilin in a timely manner to the county. They further maintained the payment of the property taxes as they were required to do. The documents that are in front of you today were the first draft that Council for Unilin had prepared, and since the time they were submitted, uh, the county clerk and I requested several amendments. Those were technical in nature, and um, we have now reached a final form of documents. We, we talked with Council for Unilin today and would ask for the board's approval of all of those documents that are listed in the agenda item, there are a total of of seven documents. The practical effect of this is going to be pursuant to the incentive contract and the lease to convey the property that the county bought for this purpose to convey it to Unilin. Uh, To certainly try to answer any questions you might have. Madam Chair. Attorney, you're good with everything, you think? Yes. Uh, we had requested, um, us, again, some uh, modifications. Uh, some of that, I think, was simply as a result of the Council for Unilin is in Atlanta, and they may not have been as familiar with North Carolina form as the style, but they were very amenable and accepted all of the amendments that uh, Mrs. Harris and I requested. And uh, we have final drafts. Uh, the, the amendments were 
minor in nature. Any further questions? I'll make a motion to approve. I have a second. motion to approve and second by Mr. Yates and Mr. Elliott. Commissioner Crotts? Yes. Commissioner Elliott? Yes. Commissioner McClure? Yes. Commissioner Shell? Yes. Vice Chair Truel? Yes. Commissioner Yates? Yes. Chair Walker? Yes. That motion carries by a vote of 7-0. All right. Item number C is a resolution. I'll turn it over to Mr. Krotz to lead this one off. I do not have that resolution pulled up and being on uh, webcast, if somebody could read it or we don't have to read it, doesn't matter to me. Um, if that's okay with you, Madam Chairwoman. If, if you want it read, can Debbie read it? Commissioners, do you need it? Do you need this red, this resolution no. red? It's okay. In line with Trump's uh, executive order. Okay. The reason that uh, I, I did look at, and I know Mr. Hill did speak about this, um, we looked at Beaufort's um, resolution. Theirs was short and sweet. I wanted to put more into it as to what we're doing. And one of the things that I find interesting is in the recent coronavirus stimulus stuff, they have $300 million allocated for refugee resettlements. Um, the federal government has said that it was the state and the local governments. Our state governor has said we would take them. This right here just kind of puts it as saying, no, we're not gonna take them because we're not exactly sure what resources and where these refugees would be coming from. Um, and that's, that's my concern and that's why I wanted to bring it to our board to get that out and communicate. Um, it's not saying no to, to any, it's saying, you know, the way I look at it is we're saying no now because we're, not, we're unsure of what the cost is. Um, and that's my, thing behind it. That's why I want to push for this to pass. Do we, what kind of issue have we had with refugees in Davidson County? Sheriff, you know what kind of issue we've had with refugees uh, here? Okay. All right, well, I, I hadn't heard any either, so that's why I was just wondering. There's a big difference between refugee and immigrant. Whenever the Vietnam War was over, a lot of the Vietnamese that helped the Americans uh, in the war and evacuation uh, fled Vietnam and they settled over in the High Point area, Greensboro area, and they've been nothing but good citizens. Mm -hmm. And uh, the refugees are the people that flew in for their life mostly. Immigrants are the ones that are just trying to come across the, uh, the board for it may be um, in danger, but it's kind of a one by one thing. The, the problem that I've got with it is we can't say no uh, because the state says yes and federal says yes. Uh, this county can't say no, we're not going to accept them because we're an arm of the state. We cannot contradict the state legally. There's a new federal case that has been passed that would allow the counties to do that? Well, there may be a federal case that, that's there, but the, in the state of North Carolina, in the government system that they have, we are an arm of the state government. We're not an independent at all. There are some states where the counties are independent entities. We are not, so far as our authority is concerned. I don't think we have the authority to uh, refuse to accept uh, immigrants. I'm sorry, refugees. You say, and, the, and you say there's a federal law that that allows this? Uh, I don't know how they would have any jurisdiction over 
Davidson County? Well, it was it was because of the different executive orders orders between the states and the Fed, and it went to court. And uh, because the federal was saying that you know a, a local municipality can say no, we don't want them, and uh, the the court system held. Chuck, I'd be interested to see if that applies to Davidson County. Because we, we don't have the same kind of government that these other folks have. And that's a pretty broad statement that Zach made, unless he knows some particulars about it. So what they're saying, what you're saying, is that the local can do it regardless of what the state says. And I don't think that's right. You know, I read this letter. I read it to say that they were going to ask the state of local. I wish we could hear Don. Chris is hard on that. I know. Don, can you hear me? We can't hear you again. Can you try that one again? Okay. Okay. When I read this resolution, I, I had two questions. The resolution that I read it said that jurisdictions that under state and local governments, they had to, they had to ask their consent. They had to get their consent. That was the way I was reading it. They would ask our consent before they uh, fully accepted. And the thing that I was wondering, this resolution regarding refuse, if we'd say yes or no, Uh, seems like we'd be locked this in uh, to uh, accept or not accept. Uh, you know, I, I don't see any problem right now. Even you, Beaufort, you know, they, they were split on it. They passed it five to two. Uh, you know, we got a lot of we got a lot of problems here now, and I, I don't think it can be something. Madam Chair, yes, if I'm if I'm correct, uh, Commissioner Trull, I think I know exactly the point that you're referring to in this resolution. You tell me if you, if I'm correct in what you were saying. We couldn't hear you, but I care okay. pieces of it uh, where it says that the federal government, as an exercise of its broad discretion concerning refugee placement according to it by the Constitution, the Immigration and Nationality Act, should resettle refugees only in those jurisdictions in which both the state and local governments have consented. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. And so and that's why that's why Beaufort's resolution was only one sentence. Because this letter is actually the executive order. So uh, I don't I don't see how this our resolution would have anything at all the executive order. I make mostly by Don and you, Mike. <laughs> I do too. I, I, I do. had to say it. I did. I'm putting a little head say it. The, the, uh, the motion that you mentioned, Mr. Krull, um, is, is the way I read it. It says state and local. So if the state approves it, local don't have a say. Yeah, that's, I think that's I, what. Go ahead, Mr. Krull. It's say state and local. State and local. Right. Both. That's correct. So if the state approves it, then that they all the all the county can do is approve it. They can't disapprove it. Well, you're probably right, but I mean the executive order says the state and local governments have have to consent. What it says. I think this is an issue we'll deal with when the particulars are more particular instead of I, I, I just don't, legislative guidance. I, I, I just I just don't see any need for this resolution at all. Um, refugees have been coming to our country for years. Uh, philanthropic and Christian organizations have been a part of helping them settle in this country. And Mr. McClure, I was happy that you mentioned, I believe they're called the Hmong 
group that worked with the Viet in Vietnam with us. Um, yeah, so, Dr. Neum. Yes. Um, so. Well, and also, uh, we have uh, a lot of us go to the Cambodian New Year. Yes. And that's a fun group. Uh, Chris Cross, you've been to that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't I see us having have a problem. a certain amount of control. Um, yes, my my part here with this is really because of the back end stuff at the federal level with the Syrian refugees. It's not the Cambodians or the Vietnamese or any of that. It's just making sure that we we monitor the situation as to who is coming here, because just like Mr. McClure had mentioned, and just like Mr. Shell had mentioned. Those groups of people, I'm going to tell you what, they open their arms. I mean, they're like family, mm -hmm. and they're super great, and they come here ready to uh, become Americans. They don't come here trying to change our ways, um, and that was my point behind it. If y'all don't want to pass it, that's fine, but I just want to make sure we stay on top of this and monitor that situation um, for future issues that may arise because of stuff coming from the Fed down. Uh, it's coming out of the house is where it's coming out of. To me, this is um, just too too broad of a too broad of a resolution for you know when we have a problem, then we'll work on the issue. But until we right. have that problem, so may I ask the commissioner? Cross, Cross, sure, Commissioner Cross, would you have a problem with just tabling this until it looks like we may have to face something of this nature down the road? No, oh, I'm I'm fine with that, Commissioner Shell. All right, Gary, what, Gary, when Bring you get back you up. Let, yeah. If we need to. I'm saying, why wouldn't you can bring it back up at any time instead yeah, of tabling yeah. something? I mean, that's it may lay on the table a long time. I I I just assume table it at, okay. until un, until it's necessary. Is that a motion? Do we have to vote on that? Do we need a motion? Do we need a motion? We need a motion. Motion to table this. Madam Chair. What, sir, hold on one second. I was, we're going to ask Mr. Fry what what his. Madam Clerk, in the absence of a motion, there is not a pending motion before the board. It's on the agenda, but if that the board correct. elects by consent to take no action on it, you simply can move on to the next item on okay. your agenda. That's what I was saying. Thank, okay. you. Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Fry. Mr. McClure, did you have any other comment? That's, that's basically what I was going to say. Okay. You don't have to table it. You just have to not vote. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Thank you. All right. We're down to item number D. Uh, Hazard pay and Commissioner Elliott uh, is um, going to be leading this off tonight. I, I would uh, just like to first, you know, tell everybody this, this listening and watching that uh, all of us are keeping everybody that not only works for us but are in the local businesses in our thoughts and prayers. There's no doubt that we cannot continue to go down. The, the road that we've been going down, and, and I see and hear from local business owners every day that's losing their jobs. And, um, you know, we've, we've had people here in Davidson County who's died of COVID-19. And in saying that, um, I know that all of us absolutely unequivocally support our first responders, the women and the men who put their lives on the line for us daily to make sure that, that we're safe. Uh, these individuals do not have the, uh, the choice to be able to say, hey, you have COVID-19, uh, I'm, I'm going to stay six foot away from you, and I'm, I'm not going to get close to you. When these people's lives are on the line, they have to go out and they have to do that. Uh, I realize that hazard pay is, is something uh, when when we're in the middle of an issue and we're already tight on a budget and and all this is a it's a slippery slope. It's a it's a subject that some of y'all might be in a in agreement with and some of y'all might not be. But I I don't feel like we can use our economic status as as something that disables us from doing what's right to our employees and those men and women that are putting their lives on the line. I know that you can get hazard pay in the military uh, for paratroopers and pilots and you know people that have to do extra and above work and and 
you know, I was I was thinking, and you know, it it's just my foundation. I feel like the good Lord gave me this, but uh, if if our position on this subject would somewhat change if it was our daughter or our son or our loved one out there on the front line, then maybe we ought to look at it because sometimes we're skewed with our personal beliefs and our systems, but when it really hits home, if if my wife was out there on the front lines doing that every day, I'd be scared to death. If my child was out there, I'd be scared to death. And I should feel the same way for my employee who's out there taking care of my family and, and our family as as the board. So that's all I have to say. I'd like to bring it up, you know, for discussion. And uh like I said, I know it's uh I know it's uh, a touchy subject, but I support absolutely one hundred percent not only the first responders in Davidson County, but all throughout the state of North Carolina. Because if I have COVID nineteen and I stroke out or something happens to me, they're gonna be there to save my life. So uh, that's so, the I got a question. I Do you support all essential workers? Um, I support every one of the essential workers. Uh, and you know what? That determination. To, to get a pay increase. I mean, you think every essential worker in the United well, States should get a pay increase? Well, you know, here's how I describe essential. Now, the state described essential, and they're, they're describing local governments as essential. But there goes another overreach from the state of North Carolina and Governor Cooper, just like he did on this Executive Order 121, where he didn't have a concurrence of the Council of State, which is illegal, by the way. But I feel like. <laughs> Absolutely. When the state says everybody's essential. Now, we're housing everybody here. Here's my definition of essential. Who is here working in the county government when we have a holiday or when we have inclement weather? Who, who, what happens if we have a bomb go off and half of this building is gone? Who's going to have to come to work? The EOC is going to be here. The Sheriff's Department is going to be here. EMS is going to be here. They don't get any time off. That right there is essential. All the other stuff, whether we want to believe it or not, we can shut down. We can meet from home. We can telework. We can do whatever. These people have to be there. And they have to be fighting. So grocery stores? Grocery stores are essential. Uh, Steakhouses are essential. Uh, Not really. You know, they, they well, I mean, somebody's got to have food. Farmers are essential. You know, when you look at the heroes that are out there, teachers are, are essential. <laughs> but I'm talking about when I look at a grocery store individual – I'm, nece I'm necessarily not telling them that they have to go pick this individual up with COVID-19, that they have to do CPR on that individual, or they have to go arrest that individual and have them in the same car with them and ride. These individuals have no choice. They don't get the choice in the matter to say, Sheriff, I'm not going to do it. That's, it. You just can't do that. I mean, uh, Alton, uh, there's no chance that you're going to tell somebody they can't get in your ambulance. I mean, it's that's where I was coming from. It's just kind of a different story. And uh, I mean, I hear you, but yeah. I'm saying, how about the people that work at the nursing home? Are they essential? They don't, they don't have much option either. They got patients to take care of. I mean, they are, they're essential. Um, We're not paying their salary, but they're essential. I mean, uh, I absolutely think they're essential. Um, you know, if, if you really wanted to know, I think maintenance is essential. They're, I mean, they have to be here. They're there working. Uh, what happens if we don't have facilities? You see what I'm saying? I mean, but. It's kind of like I read the other day. I wish my 10th grade teacher could see me now because I'm essential. You yeah, know? yeah. I'm an essential yeah. worker. She never would have thought I would have been an essential worker. But yeah. I am, I mean, you know. Um, local government <clears throat> is essential. But then you have those that are out on the front lines daily. When you think about, and I'll tell you this, so 29 CFR 778.207B, that's, that's hazard pay in the, in the North Carolina, you know, uh, the code, or the Code of Federal, Federal Regulations. And the military goes off of that. If you was to ask somebody who is on the front line carrying their carrying their gun, and then they're saying, well, wait a minute, you're not a paratrooper, you're not a pilot. How do they differentiate that? I know you get hazard pay for taking taking on fire and, and doing stuff like that. Well, our deputies have done that within the past year. I, you know, they're not asking for this stuff. This is something I just kind of, 
and I thought about that they needed, and I, you know, I, it's not that the, and I am the, it's not that the city of Lexington does it, or that Charlotte does it, or anybody else does it. I don't need somebody else to do something to tell me to do what's right. You know, we have the opportunity to be a leader. We have the opportunity to look after our staff, and that's all I was asking. That's what I was wanting to do. The, the only thing I would say to that, I think we made this too much a sheriff department issue. They're not the only ones, and I think the sheriff will speak out and tell you that. I yeah. hate to be. I well, never I hate to work, yeah. be working for the health department. Have to go in these Come facilities on. I agree. clean and 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 I mean that now that's dangerous. Yeah, they I think the country is full headed. of essential workers. I think the country is full of them. I uh, agree. Not only the sheriff's department, not EMS, not health department. I'm talking about the people out here that we see every day. That's essential workers. You know, mm -hmm. the country's full of them. Yeah. You know, it's not only our people either. You know, and, DSS and, workers. They have to go check on them children. You know, they can't shut it off. It's all of them. Yeah. Where, yeah. where do we under, stand a lot of on jobs. the FEMA? Uh, uh, that's, where I, that's where I was left to believe in the early beginning that we could uh, possibly be, uh, the FEMA maybe come up with something to... Alton's outside, and I'm going to ask him to come in. He can help shed some light. But the basic answer is we talked to the state, and I think I forwarded you those responses. Um it goes all the way to Sprayberry's office, I believe, and you know where they've kind of said it will be up to FEMA to decide. Typically, this this particular kind of pay, and correct me if I'm wrong, Alan, is not part of something that gets claimed. But given the circumstances, their feeling is is that may change. But it would be FEMA's call. Even if and we got Ted Bud's bad. office kind of trying to hunt that down, but we hadn't heard back as of today. And I've been Senator Tillis is here just a few minutes ago, and it looks like they say in President Trump's stance is healthcare workers. Frontline health care workers is what he is considering hazard pay folks. But to answer your qu question, Mr. Shell, I don't have an answer. I don't That's know. That's what I just I don't said. Know, I, don't, I can't they definitively that say change. tonight that they will accept it. I do know this. If you're going to claim it, you're going to have to have a policy, a hazard pay policy. Um, that'll be a must as part of the submission. That was my next question. Do right. we have that? You have to have – no, we do not. And – Based on the outcome of this discussion, you know, we could move forward and try. We've we've pulled some other jurisdictions to see what they look like, and mm -hmm. and the, the crux of it is just two pieces: the the what you're going to give and who's in, which is what you're basically talking about right now. So, um, some counties have done some things too, as far as um, I noticed looking at Wake counties and uh, City of Greensboro, where they distinguish folks trying to uh, trying to answer this question: who's essential by somewhat of the distancing, what what location they work in, not just the first responders that are obvious like police and fire, but, you know, also do you work in a location where you can't get the distance from somebody? Um, I noticed that in a couple of those policies, but that's near here nor not. It's, um, but you have to have that if you're going to get claimed, if you're going to, if you're going to even have a shot at getting it, basically. Well, you've got, if you think about it, you've got, uh, people that are in the sheriff's department that don't ever go out. So you'd have to distinguish against them. I like if you have a civil servant that's in the uh, in the courts every day and don't come they don't actually have to come in contact with anybody. Um, do they fit into that? How about senior yeah, services? Yes. They they are dealing with the 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 most vulnerable of the of the people that are out there as far as this yeah. virus is concerned. And you, I think you just keep going on and on, and then the distinction is going to be very tough to make without leaving somebody out, causing some feelings. But in addition to all of that, how much is it going to cost? We're going to lose, we're going to probably lose all but 10 or 15% of the sales tax coming into this county. Going Plus, we don't know what the federal, that. what the uh, state government is going to hang us with. Um, Probably going going forward. The, the reason we have the fund balance that we have is is for emergencies. And until we can find out what it's going to cost us, and we let's put it this way: so supposing that we get, we pay all of the hazard pay, and then it comes out and we can't we don't have enough money to make our bills. We have to go up on taxes, so we have to go up on the people besides the first responders and all that to pay for their hazard pay. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but what I what I'm trying to get at is that we don't know where we are on the money. 
we, we don't have a clue I can, how we're going to be here. I'd, I'd like to speak to that. I can tell you before the sheriff, I know the sheriff might want to say something, but, you know, I know we're at a 54 cent tax rate, and that's great. We've been at a 54 cent tax rate for what, 10, 15 years? And that's great. That's fine. Great job. Kudos to the men and the women who have sat in these chairs before us and kept a 54 cent tax rate. But at this time right here, what is it getting us? When we have a jail that has to be rebuilt, we're rebuilding a courthouse that had been neglected with some maintenance work. Now that's fine because they had grew. But not only just that, not to say that it's neglect, but it's just the fact that the county grows. You know, the county growth and everything that we have, at some point in time, change has to happen. And I hate to say, well, we just, you know, we can't make the what's the right decision just because of inaction or maybe, you know, the, the slot that we've been in for years in the past. It is finally caught up. It is finally caught up to a board, and we're sitting here in the crisis of a generation. I mean, we may never live to see another crisis like we're living through right now. Well, and we have right. men and women on the front. And, I mean, we have businesses. Me and Todd was talking about. He's in bad situation with, with the steakhouse, and we have businesses in Davidson County that are about to lose it all. Well, what do we do? That's kind of what I was talking about, well, uh, Chris, what, what you're saying. It's not the 54-cent tax rate. Not that at all. What it is is... How many people are unemployed? How many people have, have not will not have a job when they go back? And you're going to increase their taxes, or are you going to or are you going to manage what you got and wait until you see what you can do and then do it? Well, we've kind of waited and saw what we could do for for years. Well, we're we're in the moment right now. Let me say this with no disrespect to you, Commissioner Elliott, but the commissioners in the past have done a lot with with the money, with the 54 cents, the 52 have. or whatever. Now you have some revalve in there that, that gets you some extra money, but how many schools, I mean, they built like 11 new schools, new sewer to the school. So the money I don't think has been wasted, you know, and, and, and I don't mind. And I'm not know. saying wasted. I'm just saying, you know, but I'm saying you said, well, you know, we, it took us a while to do the courthouse and the jail. We got big expenditures, you know, these new schools is millions of dollars. That's and, right. And we know. still have schools without hot water and stuff. I mean, it's like, we got a lot to do. We've done a lot. Schools without hot water. I have, where's that at? I have not heard of a school. Central without, Davidson middle school. I'll take you and show you. Don't have any hot water. Yeah. Well, yeah, the school board bad. needs to probably spend some of their money, but I'm just saying, do. I don't want to disrespect, disrespect. I've only been on here nine years or whatever. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this work was done before. I That's came. right. But, you know, they've done a lot with their money. And, yeah. you know, they went to, through a recession and I'd with the furniture here. industry. And, yeah, that's right. You know, I've worked so. here for 17 and a half years before I became a commissioner. I saw a lot that the boards right. did, even back to the Fred Sink days, back, you know, way back. And I saw a lot that y'all sitting commissioners have done. And you care about the, the people. All I'm asking is, you know, like saying, I, I, Commissioner McClure's got a point here. He, he does have a good point. He does have a good point. We don't know how long the, the effects of this are going to last. And it, if it lasts an, into the end of this year, another year, another year, and then uh, we, we want to talk about raising taxes on people that, again, have lost their jobs. Uh, I think there's something to think about that, there. Uh, well, you definitely can't talk about a tax no, increase. At this no, point. not at this point. I mean, um, and one another thing is, you know, if if we talk about not giving hazard pay, people think that we don't care about them and that we don't value them, and we do more than ever, more than ever. But we need to decide how far down the line. That's the reason he was asking about essential questions. How far down the line do you go, and and do you decide on this group and not this group? Um, it's a hard decision. I mean, I, I, have been, I know people that have been out of work though. for a month that hadn't even got a penny. They don't no, have any no. source of income, you no. know. Uh, their unemployment hadn't started yet, whatever. Um, I think Mr. Truel was trying to say something. Yeah, I can't never Mr. hear you. Go ahead. i got one question I want to ask. When we talk about hazard pay, this is a question for Chris, I guess. Are you talking about hazard pay during the time of emergency? Has 
that would be in the time of emergency. Um, but it's, we don't, we don't know what this time's going to look like. I, I know that's uncertain. Um, but, you but know. Then, but then at the end of the emergency, do you take that pay away from them then? Is that what you're saying? Yes. I mean, at the, at the end, I don't know when that would be, but. I mean, here it's calculated for two months, but it could be six months or it could be a year. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. I mean. I don't think this virus is going away anytime soon. I don't. I mean, I think it'll probably flatline, and you'll still have cases from now on, probably um, throughout history. Throughout history, you'll probably have continued cases of COVID-19, but that's just my opinion. Wait until they find an antivirus. Yeah. You know, flu but shot. Flu they, shot. They haven't found one for the flu yet. No. Well, they have. Yeah, but, but there's so many different strands of the flu. They just guess which one's going to be the most popular this year. That's what that, you get. So I would guess for. that would probably be something that would happen with this one. But again, I'm not nowhere. But let me ask you a quick question, Casey, about medical uh, questions. Um, if we're not, ex it doesn't sound like, and you correct me if I misread you, that we are anticipating that FEMA is going to supply. The hazard pay. We don't know. Mm -hmm. We would have to. But have the that. seven percent came from that. Uh, what possibly could be right? No, um, I think that, and the sheriff can correct me if I'm wrong. When the city of Lexington did theirs back maybe a month ago, they picked seven percent. So the sheriff asked me to kind of, you know, that's what I'm modeling here for you. I don't have a strategy. You know, my my proposal was not any. I don't have one. So I just kind of picked seven percent. And as Commissioner Yates just alluded to, what would it look like just from now to June? You know, well, that's true. But let me ask you this. Why would you even attempt to match a municipality that don't have a health department, that don't have the things that the county has to fund? But they could, you know, all they've got is fire and and the, I just and, picked the number. You know, and the police answer. department. I mean, Greensboro, we did five. Wake County did five. Uh, this one was seven. You could do five. It's up to the board. You could do three. You could do, and again, I'm looking at it more, and I've added those departments there. If you see Sheriff, EMS, DS, DSS, <coughs> Public Health, that's also up for debate. Who Who's included in the hopper is for the board. No. And I think uh, Commissioner McClure made a good point. If you st listen, I'm with, with Chris. Everybody loves our law enforcement. I mean, I know. I've been there. I know. But let me tell you something. you got a lot of other entities right here. And if our potential for resources continues to drop mm -hmm. and it goes to where it's supposed to be, some of these deputies may be laid off. Some of these personnel in this county may be laid off without a job. If we don't protect what's ours and if we don't, you know, what's coming in and if we don't use it wisely, how are we going to, how, where is it going to lead to? That's what, I mean, that, and that's a, I think that's Commissioner McClure. And that's point, not just deputies, that's all departments. You, we may be losing personnel in all departments if we don't start getting the resources coming back to us, our economy. Because we're losing and we, and we, we ain't like Washington, we can't make money. Can't print it. We got what we got, and that's where we at. Right. And then we're still looking at I how we're going to build a jail. I asked this question to um, the manager last yesterday afternoon. I mean, is there a pathway for me as a business owner to get two months' property tax credited back to me? I mean, I have a business there that I hadn't been able to use in two months. So... Is there other business people out there that would like a tax credit too? That their their tenants has, have moved out or shut down or gone and and like I was telling Casey as well, our my property value is going to be going down, especially on the restaurant type buildings or a lot of your commercial type buildings. So that tax value has got to go down as well. So I'm just saying to echo what you're just were saying. Who knows what our tax revenue is going to be in the next year or two? I know we're talking about doing a uh, uh, reval. Yeah. I don't know that that's a, a good idea. So it's probably not. But in addition to what you're talking about, you, the loss of your motor vehicle tax is going to be figured in there. Of all your inspection fees, 
that you're not going to get. And so, you know, it just goes on and on that, that can eat into your budget. And I'm not, I've always advocated for a real strong fund balance. And I've been criticized, people call it the savings account. But you look at this situation right now, there are counties that are in terrible, terrible position to deal with this. They don't have a fund balance like we got. So it, that the whole thing is we save that for an emergency. Um, the other thing is there's an option to paying people for um, hazard pay. And by the way, if you go in the military, you get combat pay. It's not you know by position. If you're in a combat zone, you get the pay. But um, you can always give days off instead of money. And days off is a whole lot cheaper than than dollars up front. And if if you give them days off, they can use it the way they want and when they want. That's just an idea. I mean, we're just kicking this stuff around. It's up to you, I guess, Richie. To Can I speak? yeah. Um, first of all, thank you for letting me come and speak, but. Let me also say, you know, these guys and girls are going through tremendous amounts, especially I think of our people. We're not just uh, it's not just the virus of catching the virus. We're dealing with the aftermath. Our call volumes have gone up double because we don't only have to respond to our regular calls, but we're also getting calls to police what the governor's sending down to our people. Um, we are dealing with a county that's been shut down and shut in for over six weeks and now we're dealing with the aftermath we've got deputies that are going through a lot of things that you don't see each and every day and they need a shot in the arm to help them to show that you care about them i've got jailers that are enclosed in areas that that are having to test each one that comes in there and we've come up with a great plan not to shut our jail down and we've worked we've got help along the way with our district attorney, he helped us out tremendously to help us to get trial, to get people out and sent to state prison. So we had our, we could we could quarantine some of these people coming in. So we quarantined before we ever put them in general population for two weeks. Your jail didn't get shut down just for no reason. And what a cost savings we saved this county by not letting that jail get shut down. So these men and women inside the jail are testing, they're feeding, cleaning up, they're getting urine feces thrown at them each and every day and can you answer, our deputies, can you answer a question for me why would the me, uh, why would the jail be shut down the jail Sorry. could have been quarantined and shut down where no one would have come in had had this virus come inside the jail so it took some pre-planning that y'all didn't even know about that we've done here at the county to save the county money so these men and women have saved you a ton of money and you may not even have known it but on that point, too, there's a lot of things that they see each and every day. Uh, you know, we've been to a murder-suicide of a two-year-old baby. As we enter the mom, we keep her out, so she's alive today. But the deputies, we hit the door, can't get in the door, go in the back door. As we go in the back door, and it's all because of it's a murder-suicide. We hear pop, pop. We go downstairs, clear. We've got a got one dead and a two-year-old shot in the head that's living that we deal with. We get out of there. This is things that we deal with, plus maybe we might catch the virus as well. Don't know. We didn't get the mask up because we're giving orders. You can't hear orders with the mask on, so we don't get to wear a mask when we go in. A lot of things we go into. Then the EMS has to come in and deal with this as well. And, and it goes on and on. Yes, it does. But if we don't give our people... You said that you may have to lay them off. They may not be here to lay off. They can, there's places that they can go that's getting this 7%, 5%, whatever you want to do. We need a shot in the arm to help our deputies, to help my deputies go to work every day. You know, do they have to have it? No. Will they do the job without it? Probably so. But they might do it somewhere else where they're going to get this shot in the arm. You know, essential workers, I mean, they're getting, some of them are getting hazardous pay in, in service stations and grocery stores. They are giving it out. Uh, I mean, it's everywhere if the worker, if the business wants to give it to them. You can decide yes or no if you want to give it to us. 
and, and it goes on to the health department and DSS. I get it. We're all fighting a battle, and it's called a battle of coronavirus. We didn't ask for it. Uh, you know, I certainly didn't ask for it. I've been in for a year and five months. It's a tough time. It's a tough time for me to face my people and tell them every day and go and say, you know, you're not getting a raise this year. You're not getting anything, but get your tail out there and do it more. Go more. Work harder. I don't know. It was my chance to say it, and I appreciate the time. Any questions y'all have, lay it on me. Thank you. I don't think I got a question. Did, you, did they get a raise last year? No. Oh, well, we got a 1% and $500. What everybody That's else gets, the whole county. Mm -hmm. right. It wasn't a half percent, was it? One and a half percent. One and a half percent. One and a half percent. Plus five. You know, and we're under a pay study. We were under a pay study and probably going to get one. But this coronavirus kind of kicked us in the teeth there, too. So it kicks us and kicks us and kicks us, every one of us. You know, so it is what it is. I know I know other agencies within the county got one a year ago, got a pretty nice raise, and I'm not going to go into that. But we haven't got a whole lot. I mean, 1%, 1.5% and $500, what's the... How much did, did any other agency get more than the sheriff's department last year? Well, the sheriff was uh, most of their people are coming into this year. Unfortunately, our our pay increased you know, our pay ago, this year. Two years ago, we did six and a half to seven percent for frontline folks, and then finished it off with the lieutenants and the captains and so on the year after. Right. All right, run that by me again now. Run that by me again. The frontline folks for I think we moved their pay up equal to the cities. And it ended up being about six and a half, seven percent for the frontline folks. Well, then the following year, right, we adjusted the folks that supervise them because you just pushed all them people up next. Closer. Mm -hmm. That was the year right before, you know, the sheriff got elected. Too. I mean, it was right after. So, all of that being said, I was hoping that, and actually, you know, PTRC let me have a glimpse just on in an email of what the total cost was going to be for this coming year, and it wasn't that bad what I was expecting. With them included, I was expecting a pretty big dollar amount, somewhere in the range of four hundred fifty thousand. I had mentally prepared for four hundred, so I was pleased to see the number. Um, but he's right. For right now, all of it's got to stop. You know, until we get past this point, Commissioner McClure's points valid that until I I won't see the first set of sales tax numbers for today until probably July. So I won't even know what hemorrhaging has occurred until July. The first sales tax numbers I got a couple of days ago was for Christmas. And they were good numbers, but that was for Christmas. So you know, see what I'm saying? I'll, I'll finish the year probably okay, but I won't start knowing even the back end of this year until, until in the summer. And by then we're already into the new fiscal year. And as it's been alluded to, the budget going to get in two weeks is going to have dramatic cuts in those sales tax op things, but you're also going to have, we're also going to kind of put a buffer between us and motor vehicles and all of the development revenues, building permits, which we know are probably going to take a hit, environmental health permits, and then registered deed revenue, because all of that's going to probably go down. So we're going to build plenty of space between us and reality. And in the jurisdiction I worked in in 2008 when this happened, which is the only reference point I had to go on, and from my perspective, well, you'll get what you're going to get in two weeks is a reduction in budget against last year's and plenty of space between me and reality from the year before. And then I'm just going to stop until I see numbers. And then I, I'm going to what I refer to as the floor. I'm trying to find where the floor is, as Mr. Shell just said, get down we have to go down, 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 and it may be multiple steps until I get to that point and then live from there. Um, because it, it, Commissioner McClure is spot on. I don't know where the floor is today, and I'm not going to so know. Is there no projections? No, the state. Uh, the state is there no projections the, of where the, the floor is? The best is. case scenario was like June 19th, right? Well, I mean, the state's point of collection, no, by the time the, they uh, run it through their the, systems and book it, you're looking at two months behind. And no, you can't get them any faster. We have begged and begged and begged for years on this, and it's not no way to do it. So you're, the number I got the other day was for Christmas. Does that make sense? Now, and it's coming in April. So I won't see March's numbers when this thing started until July. And by then, again, I've already swiped it down pretty good. But is, the question is, is it good enough? 
But I didn't know if there's any projections on the state level of what, I mean, I know like the NCDOT's already said. Well, that's you know, the easy that, one because that's right, projects. Right. It's like well, I'm talking about this gas tax, yeah, so yeah, it's right. what it is. I mean, it's, but I mean, yes, I I've got people, DORs put out blanket projections, you know, expect um, big number platitude, you know, 30, 40% reduction in this or GDP shrinking like that. But the numbers are so big. It's hard to get it down to Davidson County. You know, what I mean, what what's going to be my point of collections for Davidson County is what I'm interested in, um, and that's why in my head, the DOTs. The, and Commissioner McClure asked me about that today, and that's that's interesting you brought that up. Again, they're project oriented, so they can stop a project, but it gets into and we've done that too. Next year's budget won't have as many sheriff cars mm -hmm. as it's been in the past for that exact reason because it's I can tell a car no as opposed to going to an employee right now. You know, and I'm not gonna get to that place mentally just yet um but as things come back on and we get through july and we get into august i start to see the numbers at that point we'll know ah it ain't maybe it ain't as bad as i thought it was or i cut it good enough and then we can start bringing some things back online or the alternative uh, really bad answer is uh, it's not it's not good enough and we have to start making provisions I mean, we don't know what's going to happen six or eight months down the road. We Correct. don't know, we don't know what the you know, what the bottom, right. where the end of this thing's at. And I'm not saying just the virus. To me, I'm talking about personally about the economic downfall or what could happen six or eight months or a year down the road. The housing development may fall completely apart. I mean, who knows what's going to happen to the economy. I don't help you at this point in time. But I'm just saying that's what we're looking at, or that's what I'm looking well, it's at. Well, it's part of that bigger conversation. It's part of the bigger you know, picture. Talking about hazard pay tonight, but you're right, it's a bigger conversation of, you know, and I don't want to get the alarm bell sounding now because, again, I don't know. Right, none of us do. We I don't, don't have know. a crystal ball. We still bring in money, quite a bit of money, in the sheriff's office for our sales and stuff, but it goes to help everything. And, and there's nobody in the sheriff's office, uh, I think someone said that maybe some didn't get it as much as others. Even to our office workers, they have to, uh, we've been mandated, we have to give out concealed carry permits and pistol permits. Happy to do it. But we're mandated to do it. We can't say we don't want to do it. We're staying at home. So even our people, we have to let people into our office behind our doors to fingerprint them and, and get their cards and everything. And we're happy to do that. But we don't get to work from home. You know, we we have to work from the front lines. And, and our partners do too, you know. So that's what I'm here to say. You know, we, we actually saved the county. I, who knows how much we've saved them. You know, just by not shutting and quarantining the jail. If we had to quarantine the jail and move prisoners out, move them across the state to other jails, what would it cost? Yeah, you know, it, would, would anybody, fortunate. Would anybody take them? That would be my question. If you could get them. I mean, we've really fought the fight to get the prisons to take what we have. And I'm talking about if you had somebody with coronavirus, would some other, you couldn't take them? Oh, with the coronavirus? No. Right. no. Okay. No. So they would have to stay here in our... Oh. You, we may have to time around a tree. I, you know, I didn't want to face that because there's a lot of unknowns of what we were going to do if if the jail was quarantined. And thank God it hadn't been, but it didn't come by accident either. Um, first, a lot of prayers, but second, a lot of hard work from a lot of a, a lot of deputies that are doing astronomical things. I mean, we're working everywhere. I even work the jail. Uh, you know, I do. I go in and feed. I mean, I don't want to put our people in. At Good Friday, I went. Instead of being off for Easter, I took it. You know, and I recommend you to come in there. Oh, I do um, the same see thing. See what they do. Yeah. Every do the day. Same thing. Every day. Well, we've had this for uh, discussion, and I think it's been a great discussion. Uh, and that down here for recommendations to the staff, I don't know of any recommendations we can make without some additional information. Um, if somebody um, differs from that, we can continue to, to look at this. We can continue to monitor it. But it, it, it's just like the sheriff just said, they deal with a lot of unknowns. We've got a ton of unknowns that we're going to have to deal with. We don't want to get to the point where um, there was one time I had, uh, I had the, the uh, staff draw up all of the programs that we were giving money to and prioritize them. So that if we got in a jam, we could start cutting them from the bottom. I don't want to do that. And I'm sure none of y'all want to do that. But that's a possibility. 
Well, I agree with uh, Commissioner Elliott and Commissioner Shell, and and well, it, and I see both sides of this, and uh, I also understand what the sheriff uh, is going through, as well as other departments. My fear. Um, or my question really is going to be, what is the Fed? If FEMA is going to step in and pay it, then let's go back to the drawing board and let's figure something out to receive those funds. Um, even if it's a one-time hazard pay, uh, whatever it is, we need to look at that. I do agree to do something for them, but at this very second, with the unknowns that we've talked about right now, I think it's a little premature not to have the discussion. And I want, and I hope that everybody understands what they mean to us and what they do with their job, whether it's sheriff or EMS or a child protective service worker or adult protective service worker, health department. There's so many people in our county uh, government that have to, to do things for our citizens. And um, yeah, I wish we could do more. <coughs> Excuse me. Any additional? Is that all we got? Yeah, I, I have one more. I, I see that there's a consensus kind of not to go that way. So I will plea with the rest of the board members to reach out to our legislators. And the state level, reach out to Tom Tillis's office do everything that we can to get money passed down so we can give this to our first responders. I think that's something we can all do, and I think that uh, there's some people in here that might even have more connections than me, uh, you know, to, to be able to try to get some of this funding down and to get a better understanding of what we can provide. And uh, if they provide money, maybe it could be to a whole lot more people, you know, like you was talking about, so. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll, re I'll, just, I'll reach out to several of them. Thank you. And just uh, in response to that, uh, as far as I'm concerned, there's not a consensus not to go with it. Okay. As far as I'm concerned, what we do need to look at it, I, I, is we need to get the resolution done, Chuck. Whatever it takes to make sure we're in position to receive federal funds for anything. We need to make sure that's done. Amen. Secondly, Casey, I, I would like to see a breakdown percentage-wise of these numbers from 70%, 5%, 3%, whatever, so we can know exactly what it is that we're looking at. Um, I understand what you're saying, sure. I understand what you're saying. Um, you got, to, But you've got to support that sheriff department. And I understand that, and, but we got a whole county, and it's tough. It's tough when these numbers are coming in. And when I said that a while ago about land off deputies, I wasn't just talking about deputies. I'm talking about from department, department, department. Uh, we just happened to be talking about deputies at that time. So I want you to understand that. And when I talk, I talked to you the other day about this, and, you know, here's another. I'm going to go another 30,000 feet. Even though a FEMA pays this, this is still tax dollars. You know, this is still money that has to come from Davidson County and everywhere else in North Carolina and go to Washington and come back. And like I told him the other day, if his staff's underpaid, then we need to look at it and see if they underpaid, not for hazard pay. Because, you know, they know what their hazard is every day when they walk out and face a bullet or face whatever they got to face every day at. At one point in, in my life, I wanted to be a law enforcement guy, so I knew exactly what 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 you sign up for when you sign up to be in law enforcement. But anyhow, that money goes to Ronnie. When I told the sheriff the other, I mean, goes to Washington. When I told him the other day, maybe his staff that gets this pay, this hazard pay, now, but it's their children or grandchildren that's got to pay that money back. It's not free. That money's got to come from somewhere. So it's going to be them that sacrifices later. You know, I don't know if it scares y'all or not. It scares me a little bit that we $22 trillion in debt. And we just spent $2.7 more trillion or whatever. So I, I'm kind of a little bit of a math guy, and that scares me some. And, and this ain't over yet. So, you know, mm -hmm. we may be wanting, but like I say, some, somewhere in line, somebody's got to pay it back. Now, that, it ain't all big corporations either. 
it comes from small business guys, individual taxpayers, everybody's pocket. But that's just, and and I discussed it with him the other day. The same exact thing I'm telling him now. I'm telling y'all. So, you know, ain't nobody cares anymore for essential workers like the sheriff's department, the ambulance. My mother and father's had to use them many times to get to the hospital and in dire situation so i understand them completely but you know there's a lot of essential people out here so we'll have to figure out where we want to draw the line but again if your staff's underpaid for what they do then we need to take a serious look at it but the problem is now we don't know if we have any money to pay them anyhow do you understand that part, adam right? Perry, you ready for motion Madam Chair, you ready for a motion? I'm ready for whatever whatever transpires. Yes, sir. Motion we adjourn. Motion adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Uh, did I hear a second? I'm sorry. Second. Okay. You got a second, Dave? No. It, are you a second? I'll say it is now. <laughs> yeah. Edward, can I take a poll real quick? Aye. Uh, Commissioner I. I. Everybody was there. I. Yes. 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 Commissioner McClure. Yes. Commissioner Tool. Yes. Commissioner Trott. Yes. Sometimes I can't tell. Yes. Thank you.